Dr. John Lees, who is with us here today. Uh, I'll give you a small introduction and give the floor to Dr. John Lees. Um, uh, John, Dr. John Lees is joining us from the UK. He's a psychotherapist and supervisor working in private practice in London and East Sussex. He's registered with the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy and accredited with the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy. He's, chair, he's a chair and board member of the International Federation of Anthroposophic Psychotherapy Associations, IFAPA, and recently retired as Associate Professor of Psychotherapy and Counseling in the University of Leeds. Course leader for the training in anthroposophic psychotherapy in the UK and board member of Mercury, the UK Association. His main research interest is developing the practice and theory of anthroposophic psychotherapy based on looking at cases and all their idiosyncrasies. Based on looking at cases and all their idiosyncrasies, to quote Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Dr. Lee's talk will focus on methodologies which closely follow the process of clinical practice. He'll be talking to us about autoethnography, uh, narrative, and heuristic research. Uh, we now give the floor to Dr. Tom. John Lees. We welcome you to our conference. I'm very, very pleased to be present and um, eventually present because as you probably know, I've had immense problems with my internet today. And um, when Paramal was trying to contact me earlier, I was speaking to a technician on the telephone and we didn't sort it out. I'm therefore speaking to you from my phone, um, but it's better than nothing. And uh, because of the disruption caused by this, I've got slightly less time than um, I would otherwise have had. So I will run through what I have to say as quickly as I can, but not so quickly that hopefully it's not so quickly that it's incomprehensible. I asked, um, because of the problems with my internet, I'm not able to share screen, but I asked Paramal, I sent the, um, before all this happened, I sent a PowerPoint to Paramount. Can you share screen on my behalf, please? Yes, sure. I'll do that, John. One second. Thank you. Whilst Paramount is doing that, I will say um, a few things about what I'm going to present today. Essentially, I'm covering a lot of ground. I am... Thank you, Paramount. Um, I'm going to, in the first half of the talk, introduce what I will call creative methodologies, including autoethnography, but I'm not going to say too much about them. And then in the second part, I'm going to look at a case um, with methodologies in mind. The case is... Some, I think it's the first 15, I need to check my notes, it's the first 23 sessions of work with a traumatized client. And the work has now continued to about 65 sessions, but I'm just going to look at the first part of that work. The reason I'm doing it in this way is that uh, the view I take about research uh, is that research and practice are two sides of the same coin. Basically, I am a practitioner who has happened to work in a university and know about, I therefore know about research methodology because I've done research myself. And have worked with students, master students, doctoral students, um, and helped them with their research. So, first of all, as I say, we'll look at um, methodologies. Can you move to the next slide, please? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to direct on the next one. So, in this slide, this is looking at conventional research. And as you can see, I've divided it into three sections. In the 
first part of a conventional research project, we look at the, we, I'm not going to go through the, the whole list. We look, we develop the research question. We then choose a methodology to address the question. There are other issues like ethical approval, which needs to be obtained. Having done that, we move on to the second phase of the research, which is the so-called field work, which is mainly about data collection. That will take quite a long time. Once we have done that, we then analyze the data, collate the results, and write up the research. It's a linear process. You do that first thing, then the second thing, and then the third thing. Well, there are more than three things, but the whole list of the number of things that you need to do, one after the other, in a linear, um, in a linear way. With creative methodologies, it is very different. Can you, um, can you move to the next slide, please? And the next one. Uh, just go back one slide. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on the list again. This is a quote which, for me, underpins the way to do creative research, which is possible to do up to doctoral level. It's a minority of research. It's a form of qualitative research which is based very much on the experience of the researcher. So in that sense, it's unconventional. But the reason for doing it, as well described by this quotation by the American playwright, Tennessee Williams, if I try to make a universal character, it becomes boring. It doesn't exist. If I make the character specific and concrete, it becomes universal. So in this approach to research, you need to stick as much as you can to the reality of the researcher's experience. And I will explain that as we proceed. Can you go to the next slide, Paramount, please? I don't want to go through the list and explain what all of these approaches to research are. Sorry, you've gone too far. Can you go back two slides, please? Autoethnography, which was the original research method used or suggested by this conference, is an approach to research which is based on individual experience. That is why it's called auto. It's ethnographic, which means that you're not just looking at your own experience, but you're looking at the culture that you are researching into. It was originally developed in anthropology. So an anthropologist would go to different cultures cultures as a participant observer, participate in the culture and uh, observe the different practices, customs and rituals of that culture. That's how autoethnography began. Heuristic research is, instead of looking outwards, looks inwards and into your own experience. It's a different form of research based on yourself and your own direct experience. Narrative research, I'll just say narrative research informs both of those qualitative methodologies. The other two bullet points are approaches to research. I sent an article about reflexive action research, which I wrote in 2001. 
and that is available to explain the meaning of that. And uh, practitioner research is research which is done by practitioners. And I'll be looking at this much more in the second part of the presentation. So can you move on two slides? Time out, thank you. This is a research project which was done by a student at the University of Leeds. I was the research supervisor. She is, was studying on a master's in psychotherapy and counseling. And this is her final year dissertation. She's given me consent to use this material. The, I should also say it was, um, a dissertation which is a high mark. She, now again, I won't read all this out, but there are two main points on this slide. The first one is that she has a sense that she is disconnected. The second point is she is aware that on a psychotherapy and counseling course, becoming disconnected from people is not a very good thing to, to do. Because if you're disconnecting from the people you're trying to help, how can you help them? That is why she is researching into this theme of disconnection, which is identified in her own life. And the aim is to as a result of doing this, or, or researching into this topic, to be able to become more present with her clients, as opposed to disconnected from them. Uh, next slide, please. So, because she is making it very personal, she says she would like to research into this in an autoethnographic way, which is, as I said earlier, one of the main forms of creative methodology. Now, there are two types of autoethnographic research. One is called analytic autoethnography, and one is evocative autoethnography. She says she's chosen autoethnographic methodology. That's a little bit, so analytic autoethnographic methodology. That is a little bit more, brings it theory into the process quite strongly, which is what she does in the research. But actually, although she's saying that's what she's doing, in my view, it's also evocative ethnog ethnography, as you will see from the Next slide, please, Paramal. When a student wants to research in this way, I just tell them initially to tell the story that they want to research into, which is in this case, the story of her own experience. And she has certain memories of her experience and I just want to dwell on this a little bit more because this conveys the quality of the research that she is doing and this research generally. And we could call this a narrative form of data collection. It's not numbers as, it, as is the case in uh, quantitative research. It's not interviews as is the case in many forms of qualitative research, interviews or focus groups or whatever the case may be. They're all narratives, of course, but as opposed to numbers, but they are not narratives based on your own experience. In this research, the narrative is based on her own experience. And I read these two extracts out. 
I hear the worst howls of my parents' rages. They battle on the landing one, maybe two meters away from where I sit on my single bed in my small blue bedroom. Thumps of heavy stomps on the carpet, rattling the doors, the floor, the window. I hear my mother's voice reach a pitch I've never heard before. Animalistic, piercing, pure terror and blistering rage, like the world is tearing in two. I can't remember precisely the age which she is recalling. I think it's in the second septennial. I'm sure it's in the second septennial sometime, maybe about the age of 10, but I'm not entirely. I can't confirm that completely. I think it's about that age. I'll now read the second um, extract, which is uh, certainly from her third septennial, maybe about the age of 15. I'm sitting in Camden under the bridge by the canal with my friend since primary school. We share a cigarette, though we're only 15. My phone rings. It's mum. She tells me she's sorry. She loves me. She tells me goodbye. I hang up. My friend is worried. I see fear in her eyes. Tells me to call someone, her mum maybe. I shrug and say, oh, it's not serious, and take another puff of the cigarette. She's giving an, a very vivid example of disconnection, the theme of the research. The, because in doing her research, she has, has been searching for memories from her own childhood, which are contributing to this disconnection. First of all, when she's a little bit younger, the uh, rows and arguments of the parents, she disconnects. But it then becomes habit. Henrietta was talking about habits. The, the disconnection has become a habit and she is, when her mother is, as far as I can see, telling her that she's just leaving home, the separating from the father, she disconnects. And of course, as I said earlier, this is um, this is very important to address for somebody who is training to become a counselor and psychotherapist. So, One thing I forgot to mention um, from a previous slide is that any student, whatever research they want, needed, needs to have ethical approval for the project from the university before they do it. But then this was, of, of course, done in this case. So she's given approval. The, the um, Research Ethics Committee gave her approval to do the project and she has given me approval to talk about her project. Can you move on to the next slide now? Um, I'm somehow lost this in my... I need to look at this on the screen because I've lost it in my... Yeah, uh, this is... This is talking about... The swampy lowlands is something which um, is explained in the article that I wrote. It's a term... Swampy lowlands and high hard ground are terms used by it's an educational professor called Donald Schoen, which I, um, I, I'm not very familiar with Donald Schoen, but I'm familiar with this concept of swampy lowlands and high hard ground. And what this means is that if any of you have done research using any methodology, 
you will find that you get a little bit overwhelmed with the amount of material that you are, or the amount of data that you are collecting. It can be overwhelming and you get, you're sinking into the data a little bit like um, sinking into a swamp. That's why it's called swampy lowlands. Um, and uh, as I say, it applies to any approach to research. Even going back to the 19th century, I remember reading a, um, a biography of Michael Faraday, the English scientific researcher into electricity and magnetism. And people doing the research at that time, there were explosions in the laboratory, all sorts of things going on. Not exactly a swamp, but a very um, alive, active place to be with um, getting a little bit even confused about what is happening. Because at some point, if this is to be valid as research, we need to emerge from the swampy lowlands into what Schoen calls the high, hard ground. And look at what we've done from the perspective of the high hard ground in order to not only make sense of it, but be able to communicate it with other people. Now, I just want to briefly quote from a, an article in a book on narrative research. And the issue is, uh, there's a question that the writer is uh, addressing, which is, the question is, does subjectivity distort the meaning of what scientific knowledge is? Because obviously, research experience, like the research I'm talking about, is based on your own perspective of events. I argue that all research is subjective. Even a quantitative research project is subjective. This, the only difference between many research projects and creative research projects is that the creative research projects make a virtue out of necessity, whereas in most research projects, the subjectivity and the swampy lowlands are written out of the project. And this is where I now come to quote. One way of thinking about this issue of subjectivity is to consider how the writing of scientific results has changed over time. For example, around the turn of the century, this would be about 1900, this article is written in the 20th century, so Around the turn of the century, scientists not only described their results, they also wrote of their false starts and unproductive investigations into phenomena. According to Warman, these writings were transformed by the secretarial staff who edited them to make the scientists appear more om omniscient by eliminating errors. The musing the musings of scientific imagination disappeared to be replaced by an all-knowing sense of purpose and outcome where mistakes were glossed over, mistakes were glossed over or hidden from the public's view, but with a corresponding loss of style and beauty of expression. So it's always there, even if you are a natural scientist working in a laboratory, there are mistakes and you either gloss over them or you make them transparent. We'll come to this later in the case study because I deliberately, or past partial case study, I deliberately um, chose a situation where I make mistakes as a, a psychotherapist. You cannot work as a psychotherapist without making mistakes. It doesn't exist in reality. You can write it out or you can write it into the research report. But I just want to make that um, very clear. 
So I, I won't again go through all these bullet points. I just wanted to give you a flavor of what the swampy lowlands are like. Could we move on now, Paramal, to the next? So both in clinical practice and research, we, what, even if we make mistakes, even if we get lost in the chaos and confusion of the swampy lowlands or whatever we want to call it, we um, obviously have to, at the end of the day, write a report about the research which is coherent and can be understood by other people. Now, one way of doing that is to bring in research, uh, um, sorry, theory. And here you have two pieces of theory by Donald Winnicott and Martin Buber, which explain the uh, which the student is using to explain her experience. Winnicott talking about organizing how the baby, bringing the threat of chaos and the baby organizing withdrawal or will not look except to perceive as a defense. This is how the student is understanding her experience. And the other quotation is from Martin Buber which is about the importance of making contact in the therapeutic relationship. It is a two-way dynamic process. You will notice that usually in conventional research, you do the literature re review at the beginning or towards the beginning of the research. But in this case, the student is bringing the literature review into the research as and when it seems to be important to use it in order to explain her experience. Once you can understand your experience theoretically, it begins to be much more manageable. And that is what she is doing here. So can you move on? Paramal, please. So we talk about data analysis. In this approach to research, there has to be data analysis, but it can be done in different ways, including contemplation and meditation. Writing itself is a form of analysis because when you write and rewrite, particularly if you're rewriting, you're thinking about what you have been doing and you're rethinking about what you are being you have been doing and clarifying it. So that is why it's a form of analysis. Can you move on to, the, but I won't, I, I could spend a long time talking about this, but I think I need to move on to the next slide. Paramal, please. <laughs> there is always a danger with this approach to research that it becomes what is generally referred to as navel gazing. And it can become that, and you can get lost in this endless spiral of inner investigation. But in order to make it res valid as research in a university, or anywhere for that matter, there needs to be some form of result of this in which other people are the beneficiaries of your research, not just yourself. Although you, uh, and certainly with this approach to research, will be a beneficiary, but there need to be other people as well. Normally, results in a quant qualitative project will include a list of findings, a list of results. But in the case of this approach to research, there needs to be a progression. Yeah, and this is demonstrated through narrative 
what's called narrative analysis, simply writing about the progression, just like a story. A story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, a plot which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in this case, because the aim of the research was to improve her clinical work, the, she needs to demonstrate in the research that something is changing in her clinical work. And she gives, she illustrates that with two cases. And I'm going to just quote from one of them. This is one of the cases. What is happening in this clinical relationship is that the client is constantly interrupting her. And, and as she said, it made her squirm and feel embarrassed like a small child. She's having a very difficult experience with this client, not managing very well. And she connects this experience of being interrupted with the experience that we spoke about right at the beginning, the experience of disconnection of feeling on the edge and not in the process. So she is not blaming the client for the interruption. She is saying this is something that is happening because this is what happens with me and with clients. I need to be able to change. Well, in my life, I need to be able to change this, but particularly with client work, because if I'm with a client who's interrupting and I feel excluded from the process, then I'm not going to be able to help the client. Instead, I'm going to feel like a small child because it's re repeating something from her past. So she learns as a result of focusing on her own tendency to disconnect, she begins to observe it happening in client work much more regularly, much more strongly. And, and yeah, that is what she is describing here. And then, of course, learning how to, I mean, you can't deal with a problem until you see the problem taking place. And that's what she's describing here, so that now she can deal with the problem. Can you... Um, Move on, please, Parama. So when you have finished a research project, you then need to reflect on the research project and establish its quality. In conventional research, there are four principles, eternal validity, external validity, reliability, and objectivity. But uh, there are various ways of verifying uh, quali qualitative research. This is one of them. And the reason I chose this one is because of that, the way it corresponds to the conventional quant quantitative principles. So credibility is relating research. I mean, it's various things, but essentially you're connecting with reality in order to make the research credible. In order to make it transferable, you are engaging in thick descriptions. Now, there was a very good example of this when the, the student spoke about her experience when her parents were arguing on the landing and her experience when she's smoking a cigarette in Camden. Those are examples of thick description. Dependability, we can think about in terms of transparency, This is, which is precisely what I was saying a few moments ago about not hiding the process, not writing it out, but writing it in. So you can then judge for yourself whether this is a reliable process. And objectivity, it's difficult to be objective about our own subjective experience. Well, it's not possible. So it, it's other people have to 
bring this element in. This is what we're doing now. You are the peers. You're, um, although this is not my research, we as a group are subjecting this research to peer review. Can we move on, Parimal, please? So, the reason this research is important is for ethical reasons and for schooling reasons, which and the two are very much connected. In our training in the UK and training courses generally in the UK, certainly the ones that I'm familiar with, they have a strong emphasis on personal therapy. If you train as a psychoanalyst, you have intensive personal therapy as much as five times a week, but we're not, that's extreme. So personal therapy is very important. This approach to research is mainly extending that into the research so that we can um, enhance our practice. It's a form of enhancing practice. practice. And you do this, I've mentioned Aristotelian virtues here. There are two aspects, to, two primary aspects to ethics. One is the problem of doing harm, maleficence, or not doing harm, non-maleficence, and beneficence, doing the good. So <coughs> this is why this research was done in the way that I've described it. I think I've got about 20, 25 minutes. Is that right, Paramount? 25 minutes? Anyway. Um, uh, John, you have actually just about five minutes left <laughs> because we minutes? have a break. Five minutes. Five minutes? So yeah. I've got complete time. Yeah, Sorry. Uh, yeah. So because we have break time. Uh, yeah. About five, seven minutes. So, yeah. So, I have to quickly move on. Yeah. Two slides. The next one is the case called the client and Andrea, who has, of course, given written permission for me to use the work. Um, she's aged 33, but has a lifestyle like a 22 year old. I take the view that she is a very creative person but she is deeply traumatized. Just mention one of the examples. She's huddled in bed with her sisters. This is within the first septennial, whilst the father is beating up her mother. I, I'm surprised she's not, she's not psychotic, and I'm surprised she's not psychotic. But um, I think the reason for that is that she was protected to some extent by her elder sisters, as is described in that example. Her father, as far as I can see, and this comes out later in the therapy, not in the extract that I'm showing you, certainly a lot of sexual, overt sexual behavior, almost in front of the children, but that's not going into that now, I'm just mentioning it. Move on, please, Paramount. I won't say anything about the methodology um, because, um, I, again, I wrote this article, Reflexive Action Research, that would describe it. As, there's also a book, I don't know whether it's still available, that I edited with my PhD supervisor. So we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Um, so data collection, she's describing her state of mind. It's like having dogs in your brain biting each other and I'm scared to get lost in this battle. As regards her body, she has, uh, she, let's, she talked about her brain being burning. Very good descriptions. These are by no means the only ones, good descriptions of her inner state of mind. As you can see, I'm following the same steps as I did with the research project because I see these as different sides of the same coin. Now, what I do 
experience with Andrea um, is sessions with her are very chaotic and confusing. She is English is not her first language, and this actually makes it worse because when she is anxious, her language deteriorates a little bit, or at least her English deteriorates a little bit. And her capacity to cope with life deteriorates. In the fifth and sixth session, she's talking about being given a ticket to go to a concert by a friend. She's got up late, she has the day off, and she gets into complete chaos because of this. I didn't want to think. I was thinking I am dangerous as, it, as the saga goes on. I was thinking I'm dangerous. I don't trust myself. This is the state of mind she gets into. Now, I'm going very quickly now. Uh, next um, slide, please, Paramount. This, the, the, the therapy in the first 12 sessions seemed to be going very well. But then after the Christmas break, she starts sessions and it's not going so well. And suddenly I'm beginning to get concerned. Can you go on to the next one? Uh, next one, please. I think what's happened is that I overestimated her capacity to cope. I thought she was improving be before Christmas, but I don't think she um, she was improving. We've jumped. It doesn't matter. I'll just. Um, so I'm, I'm now concerned. Um, Parimal, now go to the previous slide. Parimal, yeah, that's I think okay. go Dr. Lee requires the previous slide. Yeah, this, that's one one. this is the one. Yeah, yeah. 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 good. Um, so this therapy is fairly sloppy. Now, that term is not a term used by me. It's by, used by the Boston Change Process Study Group, who are psychoanalysts, who talk about mistakes and talk about mistakes being opportunities as well. You have to be, if you make a mistake, you need to be conscious of the mistake. If you make a mistake and you're not conscious, then all is lost, really. Not necessarily, but quite probably. But um, uh, I, I'm certainly making mistakes on, or underestimating her capacity to cope, let's say. Can you move on now, Paramal? I mention ad deckers here because a technique I frequently use in psychotherapy is techniques that he talks about in his book, The Psychology of Human Dignity, um, when he talks about situations and events. But I, I'll just mention that there are other techniques I'm using, but I won't dwell on this too much because of the time. Can we move on? So. Clearly now, by bringing in the theory, by reflecting on what's going on, I'm beginning to move to the high, hard ground in order to gather myself and make sense of what I didn't initially, or what I wasn't initially able to make sense of, and which was confusing me, was a bit chaotic, and so on. But this is not necessarily a bad thing. Because I, uh, she is very confused about life, even sometimes very simple experiences like be being given a ticket to go to a conference. And now I am sharing the confusion with her in what we can call either a projective identification or a complementary countertransference, where the there are different types of countertransference. I'm referring to complementary countertransference, where the state of mind of the therapist is similar to the state of mind of the client. That's what's happening here. So move on. So we carry on, but we're not out of the woods yet. I make another mistake. I try to structure a week because Thinking of it from the point of view of her biographical age, 28 to 35. Now, I, I think of um, Rudolf Treichler, I think it is not Treichler. Rudolf Treichler, I think, refers to this phase as being a time when we begin to understand how the world is structured 
structured and structure our lives within it. So I think, oh, well, it's also chaotic. I'll, I'll systematically help her to structure her life a bit. And we do that, but um, she's still getting a little bit panicky in session 20. I can't even plan a night out. And I realise it's not working. In the middle of the session, I realise it. So I also begin to realise that although she's aged 33, she isn't really mature enough to be 33. She's actually in the previous septennial. septennial. She's more like a 23-year-old than a 33-year-old. So the intervention in the middle of the um, uh, that session, she says, the first two hours after I get up in the morning are horrible. So I asked her about that. Um, and just to describe not just the experience of being horrible, but what she sees when she wakes up, the actual physical, concrete, real experience of her room. Towel on the chair, black jacket on the chair, um, a Korean picture in red and black, a hawker side picture on the big wall, and so on. So I think she is beginning to... I think she is beginning to um, come back to herself as a result of this, but she still misses a session. So, back, uh, can we move on uh, to the next session? So, again, I'm reflecting on this. This experience, I think, is well described by Steiner when he says that if somebody well, he's talking about dissociation in the first seven years. The etheric not held by the nerve, nervous system, carry, we carry life onto other things. These are virtually his words. It has power, life, and force, embarks on its own adventures, endeavoring to create its own disordered, muddled life. That's definitely a very... Um, sorry, you... Um, where are we? Um, Sorry, I've got where we are. Step five, high, high ground. Um, uh, can you move the on? I've lost where we are. Um, high, high ground, summarizing. Uh, again, move on. I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of you now. Uh, next one. Uh, yeah, this one. That was that one. But it doesn't matter. I've just described it to you. Um, so the chaos coming out of the fact that the etheric is not held and the muddled thoughts coming about by the fact that the etheric is not held by the um, central nerve system or the nerve sense system. But she still misses a session. And so then I am very, very concerned because it's now near to Christmas. And this is what happened in the final session before Christmas, session 20. No, not Christmas. We've already had Christmas. This is Easter now, the next holiday. She's texting me to say that she is in the house. She's locked. She's lost her keys, so she can't leave the house because if she leaves the house, she doesn't have keys to lock the house, and that's why she's panicking. So, and we, we can't obviously meet in person. and. Uh, this is before lockdown, before we were using Zoom all the time, and I wasn't used to, at that time, uh, having sessions on the phone. But we do have a phone because there's no – we do have a session on the phone because there's no alternative. And basically what I need to do as she's panicking and very anxious, regulate her attachment arousal and focus on the here and now and the fact that – the, the way I put it to her is that I think you are now making I detach to her that I mistake um, but I'm I think she is reacting to the mistakes in a way that is not necessarily negative the the, the, the therapeutic 
container, if we can call it that, is a little bit wobbly because I haven't held it very well. I've also been a bit like the father. She mentioned once her father moving from um, in the middle of her exams, about the age of 17, 18, moving from one city to the next, completely oblivious to her, the fact that she was in the middle of exams. And I actually did the same thing. I moved sessions. And I mentioned this. Maybe I've become a bit like your father. So um, this is the end of the first stage of the therapy. It's fine. We have another extra session, which I hadn't intended to have, even though it's holiday time, but she was fine. Somehow we managed to recover the situation. But I do decide that at this point um, we need, all right, uh, Paramal's sending me a, a message. I, I need three more minutes and I'll finish. Um, so I, I do decide that she needs anthroposophic medicine. So I do refer her to anthroposophic medicine and um, then a real um, healing process can take place. This is obviously just the beginning. Next slide, please. So I won't go into detail about this, but the four principles are of quality of research, uh, qual qualitative, quality of qualitative research, I um, referred to earlier can be applied to this as well. You have thick description of clinical pheno phenomena. It's all relating to reality. That's how I work generally, credibility, transferability, thick description, dependability, trying to be transparent about everything, including mistakes, confirmability. Now we have the peer review, which is what you are doing, participating in. Final slide, please, Paramal. So ethics, schooling, practice. The same principles, non-maleficence and beneficence. Um, inevitably, there are going to be errors. And we need, as therapists, to be aware of this. From a schooling point of view, this is not looking at schooling in what we can refer to as bottom-up epistemology of practice, big word, but from the point of view, sorry, it's, it, 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 that, I need to rephrase that. This research is looking, and I'm calling a low practice, I'm calling it research, is looking at the clinical practice research from the point of view of bottom-up epistemology of practical of practice principles rather than top-down technical rationality principle. And what that means, uh, I'm not telling you about the schooling principles. I'm not giving a lecture on principles, on schooling principles. I'm trying to demonstrate and show how to develop schooling principles through the process of doing the work itself. This is these, th this is a very well-known concept in academic circles. It's picked up by Gunver Keener, Gunver Keenler and Helmut Keener in a um, an article called Clinical Judgment and the Medical Profession. Gunver Keenler will be speaking at our DFAPA conference in June. And to I can you can actually easily get hold of this. This is an online av available article but it will be a good way of getting into the spirit of the conference in June, if anybody is coming to that conference. Finish. Sorry for the overrun. Thank you very much, Dr. Lees. I'm, uh, I'm really sorry for this rushed up uh, situation with you and we we'll really look forward to having uh, a much longer and a much deeper lecture series from you because we are so, uh, we, we are really interested in wanting to come in the fourth, forefront of uh, research in anthroposophic psychology. Thank you so much for, for being here.